Welcome to episode 151 of Beyond the Brick. I'm Joshua Hanlon. And I'm Matthew K. And we'd like to thank Brick Mania for supporting this episode of Beyond the Brick. For a limited time, buy the M60 plus printed crate pack and receive a free M60 gunner decal at BrickMania.com. So there's all sorts of great deals over there. I'll make sure to include a link to their website in the description of this video so you can check that out. That's BrickMania.com. And tonight on the show, we're very happy to have Mark Sandlin joining us. He is 41 years old, a graphic designer, and he has been in the LEGO community for quite a while, ever since the days of Lugnet. He is a founding member of Sea Lug in Seattle, so it's great to have you on the show, Mark. Thank you. And if you just want to start off by talking a little bit about your history in the LEGO community, kind of when you first started building, did you build as a kid and have any Dark Ages, or just build right on through? How did that work? Uh, well, going uh, way, way back, um, I think I got my first Duplo sets about 1978. I was about four, and um, I think that my parents saw that I really built a lot with those, and um, so in 1980, for my sixth birthday, I got the Alpha One Rocket Base, my first um, system set, uh, and, you know, Classic Space, um, so that was kind of my first uh, official uh, toe into the, the world of uh, regular system sets. And I would say probably 90% of my sets over the years that base. Um, and then uh, I, I never really had a Dark Ages as such where I put all the Lego away and never touched it um, because my brother is 12 years younger than I am. So during the years where I was in high school, you know, maybe I wasn't really doing Lego a lot. I still had my younger brother who was, and so I would occasionally sit down with him and build stuff with him or build, help him build things. And um, probably the the most of a dark age I had was when I went to college and I didn't have access to to my Lego sets. But um, mm -hmm. you know, when I would come home, I would hang out with my brother and build and stuff. So. Uh, Never really had a proper dark age as such. Um, a few years uh, after I graduated college in uh, 1996, um, probably when the first run of Star Wars sets came out, I got a few of those. And around that same time, I traveled back home to visit um, and uh, talked my brother into uh, giving me the collective uh, Lego collection. <laughs> um, he never really was the builder that I was. He always built. Um, he would build the sets and play with them, but he never just really had that big creative push that I always had. And uh, at the time, he was kind of in junior high and not really playing with his stuff. And uh, so I really uh, kind of got away with the Lego collection. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Devious dealings. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, but I brought that home, and around the same time, I um, kind of stumbled across Lugnet um, and started participating there. And um, was that really the catalyst for you to get kind of really like nose deep, or like you know, just dive in fully? Or like, uh, yeah, I think it, it was the combination of the Star Wars sets being released and getting the collection from my brother, and finding Lugnet, finding the online community. Um, and I, also, at the same time as all of that, I, I kind of discovered uh, in Seattle there was no um, non-train-oriented lug. There was there was the PNLTC, but there was there was no C lug. And so I talked to some of the guys in in um, in that area, and uh, uh, I recall talking to uh, I think it was Dan Parker at PNLTC. There was some display they were doing at the Seattle Center, and I said, "Hey, would anybody have a problem if I sort of just started a, a non-train-based Lego-focused, you know, lug?" He said, "No, I don't think anybody would have a problem with that." And so um, the first meeting was me and two other people in my living room. And I think that was September. I think 2000. I mean, it was 2000 or 2001, I, I really don't remember, but by December of that year, we had 20 people at a meeting, so it exploded uh, in the Seattle area. Um, 
there's a high nerd population in Seattle, so you know. It seems to be one of those like sort of the the perfect catalyst for like amazing Lego things to happen, right? Like a big, a nice tech sector, uh, gloomy weather maybe that kind of makes you want to stay inside a little bit more than normal. I don't know. Lots of coffee, so you're concentrated. I yeah. always uh, it's yeah. uh, you know the perfect story. Really, um, yeah, it it. Sila blew up way faster than I would have anticipated, and uh, so it's um, it's definitely still going strong. And uh, but there are so many people out there that I understand that there are some other lugs that have regional lugs that have sprung up around Seattle. And, uh, the arch lug stuff like that, little niche kind of groups. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it is a large metropolitan area, so I think that some of the People who are in areas that are, I don't know, a little further away, you know, have maybe started their own little groups so they don't have to travel so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Now, the one thing about Sea Lug, and I would maybe uh, like for you to like, confirm or deny, uh, but I've heard from, uh, from just different people we've had on the show that they've kind of been able to say that it sort of is like it's a nice group and it functions well together and it's, it's pretty democratic and it's just, it's like a, a nice, like a level headed sort of. No crazy like clicks and stuff like that. Do you, do you tend to think that's still true, or is that like one of the the benefits of the group to you? Um, it it was when I lived there. Um, mm -hmm. I um I haven't you know obviously I have been away from the Seattle area for almost ten years now, so I don't know how Sea Log is now. I, I would hope that um, it still is laid back. Uh, when I originally started Sea Log, I just said. Um, you know, I told everybody I, I'm not interested in having a formal structure with presidents and vice presidents and all that kind yeah. of thing. I just wanted it to be a very laid back kind of group. We hang out, we share our stuff, you know, we talk about stuff together and, and you know, um I I wasn't looking for like a heavily structured group. I was just looking for a nice, casual, laid back um kind of vibe. And it, it still was that way when I left the area. Um and hopefully they're still, you know, still down to earth and, and not too terribly caught up in, uh, uh, you know, structure or that kind of thing. Because mm -hmm. I always felt that was nice. It seems to be, uh, I don't know, I hear good stuff about it, so I'm sure the seeds that you sowed, uh, or sue, I'm not sure what, how you're supposed to say that, back then, uh, you know, they're, they're still uh, blossoming to this day. So kudos to oh. you for that, I guess. Uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, I can't take full credit for that. They're, of course, they're, yeah, yeah. They're, Great people in in the lug and uh, people who are still participate and um, I think it was uh, I think it owed a lot to just everybody who participated. You know, everybody came together and just wanted to be cool and nice to each other and and uh, I think that uh, hopefully that's still carrying forward. Totally. I no, think. It, how, sorry, Josh, you go. No, I was just going to say, adding to that, yeah, I think it definitely has. You know, everybody that we have on the show from Sea Lug or anyone I talk to at conventions from that area, it's it's always a real pleasure talking to them. It's a great group of people. So I think it's it's definitely a, a really, really great lug still going on out there. Totally, totally. And, and then speaking about the, the founding of groups, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is like a, a truth or not, but someone was telling me that you have... Uh, or you're a founding member of the Seattle Sci-Fi Museum, or something to that nature. Is this, <laughs> um, uh, is this correct? Well, not exactly. I I was a charter member of the the Sci-Fi Museum. Um, okay. That just means that I paid money to join the museum when it first opened. Um, I'm I'm not part of the administration or the, the organization or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but you I were there at the beginning. I was. I was there at the beginning. I had a charter membership. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was pretty cool to be there at the beginning when they first opened. Um, they had some nice uh, perks for charter members that first year. Um, like they had a uh, they had a private screening of Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow when it came out, and uh, the director Carrie Conran actually was there, and we did kind of a Q and A with him, and so that was pretty neat. Um, I kind of feel like it's a shame that that movie didn't really catch on more than it did because it had really great classic sci-fi stuff going on. Uh, maybe it's a little too niche, you know. It really throws back a lot to the kind of old serial type of flicks, um, but I, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. 
Very cool. Yeah, that's actually a, I saw that a friend loaned me that movie a year or two ago, and I didn't really know anything about going about it going into it, but uh, I was actually pretty impressed with it. It was an interesting movie uh, when I when I finished it. So yeah, I guess it's it's too bad it didn't catch on a little bit more. Yeah, I, maybe it's a little too retro. Um, it really owes a lot to the kind of uh, you know science fiction serial kind of stuff of the 30s and 40s. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff. There's there's a lot of elements of Buck Rogers and King Kong and and that era of stuff in there. Yeah, that's true. And something interesting that uh, you you mentioned, and I think we mentioned this at the beginning of the show when I was introducing you, that you've kind of been in the community since the Lugnet days. Uh, if you can think of any of your, uh, what are some of the major memories of Lugnet that you have? Because obviously a lot of people in the community today, but the vast majority, I think, were not around for when Lugnet was still kind of a major part of the community and still running. So what what would be some of the things that you remember doing on Lugnet? Uh, Lugnet, I felt like I joined at a time when the, I think when a lot of the LEGO community kind of started to come together online. Um, obviously, there were a lot of people who had been there for a while. There were people who came out of Rec Toys LEGO and stuff um, who had been there for years before me. But it kind of felt like around the time that I joined Lugnet that a lot of other people found it around the same time and so a lot of the kind of um, I guess old timers as you might call us uh, like me and Chris Giddens um, and John Palmer and uh, um, uh, oh gosh who else was around Wayne Hussey? In the early days what's that Wayne Hussey uh, Wayne yeah Wayne um, Wayne was a sea lug uh, uh, guy who um, he was around. I, I guess what I'm I'm thinking of is this guys who are in the Suzanne States. Eaton, huh? Suzanne like Eaton, Suzanne Rich. Yeah, yeah. Suzanne yeah. obviously was around back then. Yep. Um, Todd uh, Lehman. Yeah, well, of course, Todd. You know, started like of course. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm. I guess what I was uh, reminiscing about was the uh, the space group because those. Okay. That that was primarily where I posted was space. Um, I did a little bit in Mecca, but mostly I was in, in space. Um, so, like, Bram is that? Yeah, Brom. Brom, and, okay. And he will correct you if you ever talk yeah. to that person. <laughs> yep, yeah, really bad with names. These days we call him uh, Dr. Brom. Dr. Brom. Okay. He, he has his doctorate in, I think it's in robotics. Uh, he uh, controls the moon with his mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's You've fact. had to upgrade the title yeah. then. <laughs> that's a deserved title, yes. Yeah, that's yeah. a true fact. So this was mostly then, most of your interactions with Lugnet would be like a, a forum type of thing where you're in, like you said, you mostly did the, with space builders, just kind of would it be, you know, like build ideas or tips, what kind of stuff would you generally be talking about on there, just everything, or how did that work? Yeah, um... A lot of times it was just people building stuff and throwing it online and saying, hey, look what I made. And um, we would try to give each other you know, feedback or, or building suggestions. Um, it was really neat, I think, around that time period to watch how quickly people's uh, building techniques accelerated because you can go back and look at some of the early stuff I built from around that time, and it looks really primitive compared to a lot of the stuff that people are doing now with all of the snot techniques and angles and um, man, some of the stuff that, that they're doing now with all the angled bricks and stuff just... Um, and also it seems like the elements that they're putting out, they, they've sort of uh, have like a trend now of not putting out these like hyper-specific like molded rock pieces, but they're putting out like really functional multi-purpose elements, like a one-by-one tile that's round or something like that. So yeah. I think maybe does that kind of lead to that sort of rapid innovation? I think so because um, around that same time was when a lot of the Star Wars sets and other sets were coming out with the um, the the snot bricks, you know, the bricks with with the bricks on the side, studs on the side, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and those helped a lot with people being able to build in in more than one dimension. Um, that stuff all was kind of exploding, and I think the cross-pollination of people's ideas at, at that time was really um, 
really accelerated a lot of people's building styles and techniques um, at the same time. And uh, it was really kind of neat to, to watch all of that happen because, um, it, you know, I definitely can say that my own building uh, got a lot more sophisticated in the space of just a few years. Because, um, I, I mean, it's... <clears throat> you, you can look on some of the stuff I did on Brickshelf, which I probably should have sent uh, a link just to embarrass myself, but some of, my, <laughs> some of my early builds were really just not very good, you know. But uh, I think it was like a geometric in, uh, increase, kind of like uh, in like the sophistication of uh, people's building, like in terms of like better communication with other fellow builders, readily access, uh, re ready access to like elements. Do you think it, it kind of sort of swooped up real quick with the the early formation of LUTnet, or do you think that that maybe that's not really a correlation? Well, I, it felt like it did. Uh, there were um, there were a lot of new parts that came out around that time. Uh, not just the snot bricks, but a lot of the kind of uh, curved slopes and, and windscreens and things with the, um, uh, like some of the alpha team sets from way back then, and uh, some of those had some really interesting curved windscreens. Um, the, um, uh, a, a lot of that stuff... In, you know, it was all happening at the same time. You had this this cross pollination of ideas. Somebody would build something, and post it, and someone else would say, "Wow, how did you do that?" And then they'd, you know, do a breakdown photo of how they built it, and then that person would go and get some of the new elements and do something else with it. And so it was this kind of just, you know, new parts and new techniques and people communicating back and forth about it all happening at the same time. It really felt like we all kind of lifted each other's building techniques up at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it was almost kind of this, you know, like, revolutionary period where you all are kind of just starting out, you you just getting, gathering together on online and being able to all of a sudden for the first time, you know, communicate all these ideas and show all these different build ideas off to each other and kind of build off each other's ideas. Yeah, yeah. And, and we also had a lot of fun with it where, um, you know, those were kind of the early days of... Uh, you know, creating our own little characters, you know, when, you know, Chris started his pre-classic space thing, and, and I started my uh, evil theme, and, oh, like, uh, Greg Shaw started his Tech West theme, um, and, uh, gosh, I can't remember all this stuff. I think he was also responsible for the uh, pod fad that happened back then. I don't know if you guys recall that. It was the... Uh, it was around the time where the 8x8 uh, radar dish came in some of the Star Wars sets. X-Pods? Uh, well, they sort of looked like X-Pods. I mean, that's a different... Yeah, okay. This was before X-Pods, but it okay. was basically... He, he built the, just this little spaceship about the size of an X-Pod, and he mm -hmm. used two of those 8x8 dishes and a little windscreen in the middle, and it was just a simple little spaceship he built, but it turned out a whole lot of us had the same dishes from the, I think it was the, um, this, it was like an escape pod set with C-3PO and R2-D2. It came with two of them. And so a lot of us were like, oh, hey, I can make a pod too. And then they, people started making different kinds of pods. So you had spaceship pods and police pods and racing pods. And, and it just turned into this fad that suddenly space was taken over by these pods. And it was just kind of this funny thing that, really took off. I think it might have also caught on because some of the younger builders who might not have had large collections, they might have had a couple of dishes and they could build this little small thing and kind of join in with the, you know, what everybody was doing. And uh, It was just the funny kind of build fad that took off kind of under its own momentum. It just sort of built on itself. And uh, it, it's, it's funny that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people don't remember it except maybe us old timers. Uh, just because it was it was a flash in the pan because it really was very popular for kind of a short amount of time, just a few months, and then it kind of we moved on to something else, you know. I'm trying to draw up uh, like recollections of like other fads like that. Like I, the only one off the top of my head, and I'm, there are numerous, but uh, I, you remember the NASCAR? Like it was a, a snotted this NASCAR car with all these uh, styled, like, grills and stuff, and it was just like that. It was like a month, and it, literally everybody built one, uh, and then it was gone. Yeah, and there's been a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And, and, uh, occasionally I'll see new ones pop up on Flickr where, 
um, you know, somebody builds something and somebody else builds something similar to it, and um, uh, you know, sometimes they'll do contests, you know, that kind of thing. Sure. And I think it, it really speaks to how versatile Lego is that, you know, kind of someone can put out there with kind of a new idea like that, and then you can do so much with Lego that all these other people can take that and take it in other directions and put it in, uh, into other genres and things like that and still have a unique creation to themselves without just, you know, completely copying the first person who did it, but that person just kind of gave them the inspiration for these other types of builds. So I, I think that's, that's really neat the way that works. Yeah, and uh, that that type of thing also was kind of where Moonbase really took off. Uh, a couple years later, um, they uh, uh, a lot of the space guys got together. I think it was Brickfest 2002. I was not there, but a bunch of the space guys sat down and came up with the Moonbase standard then. And then 2003, when I first traveled to to Brickfest, um, that was kind of the, I think, I may, I may be getting my timeline wrong, I may be off by a year, but when Moonbase got started, it really took off, it got popular, um, and uh, I think it was Brickfest 2006, we had an enormous Moonbase with tons of people participating from lots of different themes, and I mean not themes, but people who people who were active in other themes were showing up to the space yeah. with their modules that they had built. And we had all this crazy stuff, like John Palmer built this huge, I think it was 9x9 nine nine, uh, base plates dome, gigantic dome, and uh, somebody came with a Hungry Hungry Hippos module that they built, and somebody else built one that looked like a big toilet, and you open it up and it had bathrooms in it. And <laughs> people were coming up with a lot of really funny and cool stuff. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's some cool stuff, and I guess that's kind of, you know, in recent years, there hasn't been a whole lot of that. Is there any uh, movement to bring any of that type of thing back in any, any time in the near future? Brick for Alabama 2016. Yeah, yeah, I, I've been talking to Chris about that. We were thinking we'd like to try to revive it. it it's funny, um, I think some of the European guys have really kept Moonbase going at their conventions, but for some yeah. reason, the U.S. side, we, we kind of got distracted and found something shiny to go look at. And uh, <laughs> But uh, Chris and I were talking after uh, Brick Fair, Alabama, and we'd like to, uh, you know, we, we talked to our Dixie Luck meeting uh, last time, a couple weeks back, and we're saying that we'd like to try to revive interest in, in, in Moonbase and see if we can get a display going for next uh, January. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Because it's mm -hmm. really such a versatile thing. I mean, as long as you have that one connector that matches up to the standard, you can build anything you want inside of your base plate. And I think that's really attractive to people that they're they're not limited by what you can build. You know, as long as it meets up with that connection, you can build anything you want. It could be a tower. It could be a, you know, anything. Hotel, landing pad, just just whatever people imagine. Yeah, that is really nice. Everybody can, like, sort of pitch in, right? You know, even people that are not, like, you know, space builders, like a town builder can just do something. And yeah. And sort of everyone, everyone on deck, yeah. That's awesome. And some people would even do that kind of thing. Um, one of the Seattle guys, uh, might have been Thomas Garrison, maybe. I think he, he built a castle, and he built a moon base connector on it and stuck it on the layout, and he had it. Is, you know, turned it into a moon base uh, module, but it was really just a castle. It was just kind of, you know, but it's really fun. You know, so people would do that. They'd show up with whatever building that they had made or theme and just stick a connector on it and have some fun with it. Mm -hmm. So after the, the kind of, you know, uh, dwindling in pop popularity of Lugnet, uh, what was the, the first site you kind of moved to as Lugnet has kind of lost its popularity over the years? Uh, what was it? Flickr, mock pages. Where where did you move to over the years? Um, for a while, we had a, a classic space forum, and uh, we um, you know had a, a, the community kind of going over there for a while. And at the same time, Flickr was getting really really popular, and um, 
So after a period of time, people really heavily migrated over to Flickr, and it it kind of seems to me like Flickr. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like Flickr seems like it's really kind of the core of the the community these days. That's the vibe that I get. It's so big now that I could be off base there, but I know. Uh, from Bricks to Bothans is still pretty big, and I think Eurobricks is still going. Um, but uh, I don't know if you guys have a better sense of that than I do, because I, um, it really just seems... I think it sort of does. It's still Flickr-centric for the most part. I, mm -hmm. I do notice other social networks like are sort of starting to factor in a little more, like Twitter, Facebook. But uh, as far as like niche like websites where a ton of uh, Lego people like mock pages, but not really. I don't know. Yeah, I think you, you'd see a little bit of mock pages, but I think you're definitely right. Flickr, I, you could definitely say, would be kind of the, the center as far as you know sharing photos of your builds and people talking about the builds and, and things of that nature. And obviously, like you said, like FBTB and sites like that, you've got some big sites out there, but as far as sharing build photos, I think Flickr is definitely kind of the number one site. Even with the somewhat in recent years, people have grown a little more upset with Flickr and some of the updates and things they've done but I think it's, it's become so popular at this point, it's hard to move away from. Yeah, one, one of the things that Flickr took away that I think really was frustrating, and one of the things we liked about Flickr from the start, was the ability to draw the little box on the photo with a note, mm -hmm. and you could very specifically put the box around something and say, I like this, or how did you build this? And, and the ability to note something, you know, pointing directly at it on the photo was valuable to us in the Lego community because we could very specifically discuss our mocks online and Flickr got rid of that function or did did something with it I you know obscured it or something I I think you might be able to still use it but you have to use some kind of a plug-in or some kind of thing that I don't recall but that was frustrating when they kind of swept that aside because that was something we used a lot in the Lego community was to, to note little bits of the the photo that we wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when they did that update, and like you said, you know, it was really useful for the, the Lego community, and I think that was one of the first updates they did that upset a lot of people, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, like we were saying, at this point, it's become so popular, I think it's it's hard to move away from, and you got to kind of make do with what you've got so far on Flickr, but it will be interesting to see if another site pops up, or a few other sites over the next few years, and more people start to move away from Flickr if something better pops up, but I don't know. It'll be, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Now I, I wanted to make sure we talked about some of your, your builds on the show here as well. One of your most recent builds that I think you still have built there, if you want to pick it up and you can kind of show it on the camera, is your kind of reskin you did of Peter oh, yeah. Reed's exosuit. Uh, this is a really neat little build yeah, you did, so if you want to talk about this a little bit. Yeah, this, this little guy right here... Um, Basically, I just took the exosuit skeleton, and um, I did a lot of rebuilding in the arms, obviously, but the um, the middle of it is really largely the same, because you can just open it right up, and it's pretty much the standard exosuit inside. Um, I just wanted to put, like, a classic space kind of cockpit on it and add a few bells and whistles. Um, you know, and I put like a little rocket pack on the back of it and that kind of thing. Just uh, just something fun to do. Just make it blue and gray and put some bumblebee stripes on it like like the good old space, you know. Uh, I, yeah, it's just something that was a lot of fun to do. Um, it didn't take very long because um, as we were talking about earlier, I have a three-year-old, so my build time is restricted right now. But of course... <laughs> Well, three-year-olds are, uh, they're big enough to destroy things, but not old enough to have any impulse control, so it doesn't mix well with a Lego room. That's a volatile combination, it really is. Yeah. yeah. Now, you, you, I, the Chris has a, a very, very, I would say, I don't know, one of the most, like, positive, like, AFL dad, uh, doting son uh, kind of, like, relationships going. Are you going to model uh, your hobby and your child interaction off of what Chris has done, or... I don't know if this is a really weird tangent that you don't want to go on. No, that's totally cool. I uh, When I first moved to Atlanta, uh, Chris's son was about six months old, so 
I've kind of watched him grow, and um, I do think that's really great that you know they they can share so much of the hobby, and um, you know I would like to do the same with my son. He has a bunch of Duplo upstairs, and seems to have a knack for for putting it together. So that that of course makes me really happy that he has that little bit of creative spark, you know, because I think that we're going to have a lot of fun building together as he gets older, and I definitely want to share all of this with him and, you know, get our hands in the bricks together and really, you know, have some fun and build stuff. I think that's something that is really great uh, with LEGO is that it, um, you know, it's such a high-quality type of plastic and, and toy that it lasts, I guess, virtually forever. I mean, I've got parts in my collection from when I was six so you know I'm you know parts that are you know going on 40 years old that still work and fit together and and are, are solid pieces that uh, you know I, I'd be happy to you know pass this stuff on to my son and, and he can build and enjoy and um, uh, yeah I mean I think it's a great hobby to share um, with uh, you know our uh, you know sons and daughters out there um, and uh, it's really cool to have been in the community as long as I have because I've watched um, not just Chris's son, but I've seen other uh, parents and kids and watched the kids grow up and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's really neat that, that people can share that with their kids and, and make it a generational thing. You know, that we can kind of pass down and uh, share that love of you know creating and building uh, that kind of thing. It's, I think it's really cool. Yeah, it really is priceless. Yeah, you can't can't really put a uh, value to that. It is awesome. Mm -hmm. Very multi generational, which I think is is really cool. So you can have adults, kids building at the same time, and and they they all enjoy it. And something I was going to ask you about when you were showing your your Peter Reed's exosuit like reskin build there, uh, what was your initial thoughts when they announced the the exosuit uh, build and that they were going to make that? What was your when you first saw photos and things of the build? What did you think? I uh, I thought it was really cool. I mean, I you know um, I met Pete uh, back in uh, I get I think it was Brickfest 2006 when he came over, and it was funny because at the time. Um, you know, I walked into the space area, and he's standing there setting up some things, and he turns around, and he has this T-shirt on, and it says Lego Lover Man on it. And he's, you know, Peter's very friendly, so he's like, Hi, I'm, I'm Lego Lover Man, and I'm like, um, what did you build? And so he's, <laughs> he, you know, his turtle that, that he, this was one of the earliest things that he did was this little turtle. And so he picked up some of these, and I'm like, oh, the dude with the turtles and the mechs. And so it's like... When you go to a convention for the first time and you may not recognize somebody's face, you recognize their 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 mocks and their their builds. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when when I kind of met him there and saw his stuff, that was really cool. And so, um, you know, Peter's such an awesome guy. He's uh, just a really cool guy and very very nice in person. And um, you know, I couldn't be happier for him to have his uh, exosuit get picked up for Lego Ideas and. Uh, you know, I, I think it's awesome that he kind of took advantage of the opportunity to get us the green spacemen, which, which I have a bag full of right here. Got a whole bag. Uh, of bricks and pieces, right? Yeah, I got on bricks and pieces and ordered a, a fistful of them when I still could. So that was really great that he was able to get us the 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 green spacemen that we never had when we were growing up. So, you know, that was awesome. Totally. It's always nice to have like a, I don't know, like an Easter egg, but not really an Easter egg because it's not really secret. It's right there on the box. But you know, something cool to throw in there for, just yeah. It, it, well, it's it's a treat for those of us who are old enough to have wanted a green spaceman back in the day. You know, mm -hmm. that's uh, something that uh, I think was really cool to just kind of have that. You know, like we never had a green one, and um. If we can just get someone else to get a set going, maybe we can get a, a gray spaceman. <laughs> uh, there was there was one uh, classic space. One of the little vehicles, I can't remember if it was in the Alpha 1 rocket base, it was a little rover, and it had a set of gray air tanks hanging off the front of it. And that, in my youth, was the foundation of legend, because somebody would be like, oh, I knew my cousin has the gray spaceman, and no, -uh, there's no gray spaceman. 
for, the, for a long time, it was this thing, is there really a gray spaceman? And, well, there isn't, but maybe there could be. If someone else gets a set made on Lego Ideas, maybe maybe they could throw in the gray spaceman to go with our green ones and, and all the others. So what you're saying is for Peter's second idea set that he's going to get, sure. he should have a gray spaceman. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although I, I do know there are some people out there who will lobby for an orange spaceman, so there there might be some uh, uh, debate over that that particular. I could see the merits of both, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess that that kind of leads me into my next question. That I was going to ask you is uh, you've obviously been in the community for a very long time here. What are your your general thoughts on Lego Ideas? And before Lego Ideas, Lego Kusa was around, was this something that even in the early days of the community had been discussed as something that would be really cool to have, like a website where you could submit ideas or some way for fans to do a build and submit it to Lego to make a set with? Um, I I think so. I'm, I mean, I'm trying to remember. I um I I participated in the first wave of Lego Ambassadors. Um. But that very first wave that I was a part of, I think we spent most of our time just trying to get LEGO to be aware of us because they sort of... Um, they knew they had a fan community and they weren't quite sure what to do with us. And so being part of that first wave of ambassadors, I think mostly we did more communicating with LEGO about general concepts than we did actually building much of anything or... or you know, we, I think we felt like we didn't really accomplish a lot, but I think what we did accomplish was just a dialogue with the company and people inside the company becoming aware of, of the community as we were. And then I think since then, you know, we've had more and more people participate in the Ambassadors program, and it's, it's grown. Um, and I, I think as LEGO became aware of us and, and our, our passionate nature they realized that uh, there were a lot of us who were interested in trying to collaborate and participate on maybe having a set. And they they tried with the Lego factory thing. Uh, and I, I think for logistical reasons that didn't really take off. Um, but I, I think that they saw that people wanted to, to get their stuff out there and, you know... Um, you know, the Kusu came around and I think, you know, morphed into ideas over time. And I think that uh, since they've had some stuff come through that and be successful and be popular, I think that it's going to stick around now. So, um, I don't know, maybe I just rambled more than I answered your question. Uh, it, it, it's kind of... Totally not, though, it, because it's, it's, it's like Lego was really at the cutting edge, you know, of, like, that whole, like, crowdsourcing, and then, you know, a company makes really the product were. that's been sourced. They were really there way before anybody else was. So the fact that when they were there, they were kind of, like, you know, a little bit shaky on exactly how to execute is kind of perfectly forgivable, I feel. Yeah, they really were, and I, I really think that they... Um, at the time, Lego started Lego Ambassadors and and had their public face at our events. No other toy company was really doing that. Most other toy companies were keeping the crazy fans at, at arm's length. Like, you stay over there. We don't want. You know, they just, you know, and Lego really reached out to us and really, you know, I mean, what other toy company? And, and we're talking 2003, 2004. What other toy company would have had the president and, and owner come to a convention and walk around and shake your hand and talk to you face to face? You know, because I met I met uh, Keld Christensen and, and uh, Jürgen Knutstorp at Brickfest. I think it was 2000. I think it was 2005 that they, they came. It was, when it was still at George Mason. Yes, and it was it was the Lego fiftieth uh, anniversary, I think, because okay. we had the little red arm band, wristband things that they were passing out and stuff. But they they came and talked to us and and you know were very interested and in, and in just at the time that was phenomenal that uh, um, the 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 owner and the CEO of a company would actually outreach to fans in that way. That was just unheard of at the time. So I definitely give Lego a lot of credit for reaching out to us and participating with us as fans and, you know, really 
that that was just a really an amazing thing for them to do at the time. Yeah, I mean, when when you think about that, I mean, not just toy companies, just any company at all. The the president, owner, like that, going to a convention of fans. That's I think definitely highly unusual. Uh, I would say so that that is that is pretty amazing when you think about the the fact that they were willing to do that. And like you said, you know, get you know, shake your hand. You know, this was personal interactions with the fans. They were they were doing at the convention. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's really interesting. Then, so it's 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 cool to hear some of that that history about uh, how that kind of formed in the community over the years. That's that's really interesting. You're making me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get it out there, Mark. You know, this is well, this is like a record. You, you know, just think of how many people our age don't know any of this. You know, we we got to like get it out there. That's this. This is the good stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. So, do you have any uh, projects planned for the future then? Any builds coming up, or any any Lego related activities you have coming up over the next year here, maybe? Uh, nothing hard set right now. I would say probably, um, you know, Chris and I are going to be doing a push toward trying to get a moon base going for uh, Brick Fair Alabama in January. Um, I um, my job status has changed recently, so I will hopefully be able to attend some other conventions. Um, I'd like to be at BrickCon. And hopefully, maybe Brick Fair Virginia too. If I can squeeze both of those in, I would like to be able to do that. Um, you know, that would be really great to be able to uh, go to as many conventions as I can. Um, but uh, my former job, I, I was just my schedule was not compatible with any conventions, and so I was very frustrated for a couple of years there, just not being able to fit it in. So this year, I've already been to Alabama. I'd like to definitely go to. Uh, you know, uh, Virginia and BrickCon if I can, and just kind of really get back out there and, and see a lot of friends that I haven't seen in a few years. Um, you know, I'm really uh, looking forward to trying to participate more. Totally. So, and it's, it's all about, you know, kind of getting out there and sort of talking and hobnob and all that good stuff. Yeah, it, for me it really is. When I go to conventions, I I don't care so much about participating in the activities or the seminars or stuff as much as I just want to go and see people and talk to my friends and hang out look at what each other built and you know it's it it is really fun to go to a convention and see something that someone built that you've only seen pictures of it online and to be able to pick it up and look at it and turn it around and stuff and talk to other people about how they built it and what they were thinking and all that is so much better than it is just looking at pictures online. So that's a huge part of the conventions for me is just people and just talking to people and, and just kind of, you know, and even just hanging out and making stupid jokes is just a lot of fun, you know. Totally, totally. Lego nerds are the best nerds. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's fairly certain of that. <laughs> So obviously you've been able to make it to a lot of conventions and shows over the years that you've been in the community. Do you have any particular stories that stand out from any of those conventions you made it to? Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Uh, they, uh, I, um, I guess one that leaps to the front of my mind, um, is our, uh, our our dear friend Mike Crowley, who's no longer with us. Um, in BrickFest 2006, he did a backflip out of the back of my car after we'd gone to the Lego store, um, <laughs> which is it's ridiculous. But uh, at the time, I, I was driving a Honda Element, and the back of it opens up like a clamshell, and the back seats actually can recline. And, and you know, it's supposed to be like so you can camp in it or whatever, but... Mike did this thing where he's sitting in the back seat and I opened up the back of the car and he pulls the lever and just flips backward in the back seat, rolls out of the car and lands on his feet. <laughs> like, oh my God. And so we're like, okay, you got to do that again. And so we had, we got somebody to do a video and on the video he actually rolls out and like lands on his head or something. Like he just was, he wasn't able to repeat it. Somewhere out there somebody has a video of him rolling out of the back of my car and falling down. Uh, but, yeah, that's something that kind of uh, comes to mind. Um, and also at that convention, we crammed probably 
maybe 20 of us together in um, mine and Chris's hotel room, and we watched Megaforce, which is the awesomest movie of all time. Uh, <laughs> 20 people in a hotel room, though. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was kind of smelly because it was a bunch of guys with stinky feet and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> but the movie's just that good. It was worth oh. it. <laughs> It's, it's well. The word for it is awesome. It's it's uh, mm-hmm. awesome movie. It's it's not a good movie, <laughs> but it is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> not mutually exclusive or, or or mutually exclusive. I don't. I don't uh, know. Yeah, I don't know. It's one of those things that I don't think you can even buy it on DVD. I think it's one of those things you got to go and try to find and get off the internet somewhere. But it's some Chinese torrent site. Yeah. Maybe it, it's a completely ridiculous maybe. movie. You can probably Google some pictures of it, but it's got flying motorcycles and dune buggies with lasers, and uh, it's it's ridiculous, but it's awesome at the same time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very so, yeah, cool. A bunch of us crammed together and watched that movie and laughed and hung out, and uh, you know it was a lot of fun. Uh, just. Uh, one of those things that's um, kind of the you know the stuff you take away from conventions where you just remember hanging out with friends and just having a good time. Yeah, I don't think it's like I, I won the combo build on Saturday night, the first one of three. You know, that's a <laughs> big takeaway. Yeah, no. Eh, yeah, the stuff you so the stuff you take away with you is is the you know hanging out with friends and just having a great time together. So totally. Yeah, and that's that's why it's so neat to be able to, to make it to convention, which I know, obviously, unfortunately, there aren't, you know, uh, not everyone can make it to them due to, you know, distance to drive and time, and like you said, you know, trouble if you can't get off work and things like that, but if you ever have an opportunity, I uh, highly suggest you try to make it to at least one convention sometime so you can experience some of that and be able to meet some some cool builders in person. Definitely, every LEGO fan should try to experience that at least once. Yeah, absolutely, and and it's worth it to. Um, it's even better if you can make it to a convention where you you know somebody that you've made friends with online, because usually if it's somebody that you've chatted with online and and shared jokes with online and stuff, when you get together in person, it it just keeps going. You just feed off of each other's energy and humor and stuff, and it's just a lot of fun. There's. Uh, I don't. I don't know if there's anybody that I've met in person that I haven't enjoyed just as much as talking to them online and and, and more. You know, and uh, I think that uh, it really it has been a lot of fun because you know, Lego people get together and and we all kind of have. I think generally those of us who get together have a pretty good sense of humor, good nature together and stuff, and just kind of we all enjoy each other's company for the most part. And uh, just uh, it's something that I really I, I agree. Everybody should try to do that uh, at least once, but multiple times because you know I think that you know I've made some of my best friends through this hobby, um, and uh, it's something that's uh, really great if if you know other people can do that as well. Totally. Yeah, I think that's you, definitely true. You moved from uh, Seattle to Atlanta, but you have gone back to Seattle for BrickCon, right? A few times, yeah. Um, I think I went to 2008, 2009, and 2010. I haven't been back since 2010 because I, I had a job that we had a, a big catalog deadline that happened in October every year, which meant that I couldn't get away to go to BrickCon, so... Now that I have a new job that doesn't have that limitation, I definitely want to get back to BrickCon this year and, and you know get out there awesome. and friends and stuff. Heck yeah. <laughs> Very cool. And I think to finish it out for us tonight, uh, out of all the sets you've seen over the years, do you have an all-time favorite LEGO set? Maybe one from your childhood or just one that when it was first released really struck you as an awesome set? Um... That's a really big question because there's been so many great sets since then. I do remember um, being a kid and going to school, and one of the other kids showed up, and he had the new Lego little catalog booklet that used to come in sets. It was like the they were rectangular, about this big, and it was that was the Lego catalog at the time. You would only get it in a box with the set. It wasn't like you know these days you get the 
catalog in your mailbox and it's a big you know thing but back in those days the Lego catalog came in a set and it was the little rectangular thing that you could see the scans online mm -hmm. anyway one of the kids showed up and he had the new catalog and it had the he flipped to the classic space section and we're talking around 85 I think and it was the Gamma 5 laser craft because the space it was the black suited spaceman that was like the big deal. He was like, look, it's the black suit spaceman is awesome. And, you know, that was kind of a huge deal at the time. <coughs> um, and also, I, I, you know, I think it was probably that same year for Christmas. I got the Galaxy Commander uh, set, which was a big deal because it was, I think for that time period, it was probably the biggest Lego spaceship that had been officially released. So that was kind of a, Big deal for me, you know, just going, just having that nostalgia for that kind of thing. Obviously, since then, we've had bigger and grander sets, you know, like the UCS Millennium Falcon and all that kind of thing. We've got sets now that I could only have dreamed of as a kid, but, you know, just tapping into that childhood kind of vibe, uh, some of those space sets that came out when I was a kid, you know, they're a big deal. Um, I know kids now... God, they've got so many things that we wish we had. <laughs> There's like, not only Star Wars sets, but they've got some really neat themes. You know, the Ninjago and the Legends of, of Chima and, and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff has some really cool and different things going on that uh, kids these days just, they don't know how good they got it. <laughs> it's true. Benny's That's spaceship? My, I don't know. Back in my day, if you had four macaroni bricks to make a circle out of, that was that was something. That was about as good as it got right there. <laughs> wow, Kirby bricks. <laughs> well, that, that's really neat. So yes, it's interesting to to hear some about uh, your your favorite sets you've you've had over the years. So obviously, space has been a major part of that uh, growing up, and even still today with the, with the builds you do now. Yeah. And so I think that finishes it out for us tonight. I really appreciate you joining us on the show tonight, Mark. Where's the best place for people to keep up to date with uh, your builds and, and what you're doing? Uh, Flickr, you know, whenever I build something new, it shows up on Flickr. Um, and, uh, you know, anybody, typically, if they want to contact me, they send me a message through Flickr. Um, I mean, I'm also on Facebook, but I don't really use it for Lego purposes. That's just you know, my whatever friends and family kind of thing, but uh, all of my Lego stuff shows up on Flickr, and that's my primary kind of where I put my Lego stuff, so. Okay, sounds good. I'll make sure to include a link to your your Flickr account in the description to this video and the builds that we talked about so people can check all those out if they want to, and definitely encourage you to start following Mark over on Flickr, and you can go back and see a lot of his older builds, he's got some really cool stuff there, and then obviously keep up to date with everything else he's doing over there as well. And I wanted to remind people about the Brick Builders Club over at brickbuildersclub.com. You can start receiving your monthly box of really cool LEGO content, like custom LEGO pieces and stickers. That's brickbuildersclub.com. I'll put a link to their website in the description as well. So I really appreciate you joining us on the show tonight, Mark. It was great talking with you. Thanks a lot. And Thank thanks you, everybody out there watching. Encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel here at Beyond the Brick to keep up to date with all of our latest episodes. We will see you soon.